it's Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we left off there uh, last time. And I just want to uh, look down at verse 16, if I could. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. And I'm going to, there's a, there's a two-word phrase here <clears throat> that in my study for this, uh, there was, there's a few little words. I, I, I'm, I'm big on words. I mean, this is the Word of God, so you ought to be big on words. And so you, you're, you're defining words. You're finding out why God chose that word rather than another word. And uh, some of the little phrases that you, that you read in the Bible, it's very easy to just jump over them as if they don't matter. Or, worse than that, and we're bad about doing this, we have a preconceived idea as to what it means. And so when you get there and you look at it, you say, well, that's what that means. You just keep on going. That's why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Because that little phrase could very well mean something that you don't think it means. And the very phrase is in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 5. It says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, good works is an important phrase to understand. Let's, let's add Scripture with Scripture. All right? All our righteousness is. That's what the Bible says. Not all our righteousness. All our righteousness is. Now, if you, by the way, if you'll type that on your computer, you'll get a little red squiggly line under it. It says that's not a word. Well, God said it's a word. Because it's a descriptive word. Not just some of my righteousness. All of my righteousness. Anything I can attempt on my own can never be good works. Now, not occasionally, never. And much of what goes on is our righteousnesses. And God says they're filthy rags. So much so that as we continue on this study, we'll see that the only way that good works can ever be produced in our life is by God through us. There is no other way. So that changes the definition of good works. Well, I did, a good, I did something good here. I, I was nice to somebody. I did this, I did that, I did the other. What God ca characterizes this as good works is something only that He can do through us. So it says here, it says, let your light so shine before men. And where do we get the light? We get the light from Him. How, how, do we, how do we stay in that light? By being in fellowship. We've already talked about that. Let you may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Good works glorifies God. Our righteousnesses glorify us. No good. No good. It, this, this is not about us. We have the wrong idea about that. Did you know that God saved you for Jesus' sake? Well, I thought it was all about me. No, it's all about Him. He saved you for Him. And He saved you so that you could actually do good work. Because that's the only way we can do it. So, let your light so shine before men. Uh, it cannot be a compromised light, because compromised light is not God's light, it's man's light. So what fellowship hath light with darkness? And the answer we've already looked at that is there's none. All right? And, and we, we really need to get that. All right, now we're, we're going to deal with fellowship a little bit more tonight, and then we'll get to the idea of the door of service. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, verses you're very familiar with, I know, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed them. Uh, they're, they're, it's His Word, and they are profitable. Now, are we Bible believers? Uh, don't we believe that the Bible is absolutely pure and accurate and decent and in order and all of those things because it came from God? All right, If God <clears throat> has a list of things and He puts something first on that list, there's a reason why it's there. 
God never does anything just arbitrarily. So in this list of profitable things, the very first one is doctrine. So why do you think doctrine is attacked so much in religious circles? Because God put it first on His list. And if doctrine can be watered down or changed or altered or misinterpreted, we've stepped away from God, which is exactly what the devil wants done. Okay? So, doctrine is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. There it is again. So these good works are now being produced by the Word of God in our lives. The light that we walk in produces good work. So without fellowship, we're walking at a distance from God, and we might be going through all kinds of motions, and we might have a smile on our face, and we might be shaking people's hands, but we're not doing good work. You cannot do good works apart from having fellowship with God. Okay? So, since we believe the Bible's inspired, it's God-breathed, it's profitable for doctrine. God chose to put doctrine first on the list, and since God does everything that He does decently and in order, He does it perfectly, it's in its proper place. Do you know what you believe? And then the second question would be, do you know why you believe it? Well, that's what Grandpa said. Well, that could be. And Grandpa could have been right. But Grandpa could have been wrong. Why do you, why do you believe what you believe? Uh, at the funeral today, I, I, I made a statement, and, and I was talking to the pastor about it before the service. Uh, you know, all kinds of people have all kinds of different ideas about funerals, and, and, and I, I understand that. But if you call me to come, you know, preach a funeral, one of the things, the first things that crosses my mind is I know who called me. Not the person on the phone, but the person that called me to preach. That's God. And so I'm going to go there and do what the person that called me to do this to do. And so I, you... You don't sugarcoat that. Right. You have to tell the truth. Right. It's only the truth that makes you free. Right. And so I, I mentioned this statement today. I said, there are some people who believe that when you die, you're just gone. You know, you're, just, you're, you're annihilated. That's it. And I said, but any person that ever died believing that doesn't believe that now. Right. Any person that ever thought that heaven and hell was just a fairy tale, if they died believing that, they don't believe that now. It's not a fairy tale. Doctrine, what the Bible teaches, what the Bible instructs and gives us as instruction is absolutely vital if we're going to be right with God and walk in fellowship. You need to know why you believe what you believe and you need to know that what you believe is right. You say, well, I'm not I'm as smart as this person or the other person. I didn't say anything about intelligence. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with submission. If you'll submit yourself to God, God will give you what you need. But if you approach it from, you know, arrogance, then God can say to it, God can put his hand up like that, you know. Say, so you can't approach me that way. Uh, we think all roads you know, lead to heaven and this and that. No, no. God says, no, it has to be my way. So fellowship has to be through doctrine. It says that here. Uh, to set aside doctrine for some ulterior, uh, ulterior motive is to violate the Bible. Right. Uh, and that's a battle that's not just being fought now. It's been fought from the beginning. Right. I mean, what, what was the... What was the very first thing that the attack from the devil was? The, the attack was, God didn't say that. God didn't mean that. 
Let me tell you really what God means. That's what Satan did. Yea, hath God said. Well, and so the, the, the fight goes on. And uh, as David said, I once was young and now I'm old. That's, that's kind of where I am now. I once was young and now I'm old. And my days to battle, I don't know how many there will be, but they're less than there have been. What about those that are coming along now? By the way, to have a church with all these young people in it, wow, what a blessing. But they have to pick up that mantle and go forward until Jesus comes. Now, I mean, Jesus could come today. I mean, I don't know, but we need to continue to fight the good fight of faith and to, and to hold firm on the doctrine of the Word of God. You just have to do that, those that are younger. You cannot tolerate false doctrine and have fellowship with God. Compromise never gets you closer to God. Never. Never. All right? Now, the, uh, what uh, Brother Philbert wanted me to deal with in, in St. Lucia was new evangelicalism. All right? Now, let me, let me uh, just say this at the very beginning. New evangelicalism is not new. It's not. It's been around practically forever. I came across this uh, uh, definition in, in uh, I, w I was searching for on the internet about some things and I came across this definition and I think it's proper to give credit and I'll do that uh, and uh, I believe it was David Cloud that, did, that wrote this and he wrote some type of a booklet or a book about this and this was his introduction. Now I'm going to give you the introduction uh, to his book and then I want you to understand what it, what's being said here, okay? Here's the definition. Uh, new evangelicalism is characterized by a repudiation of separation by a love for positivism and by a repudiation of the more negative aspects of biblical Christianity. It is a judge not philosophy. It is a dislike for doctrinal controversy by exalting love and unity above doctrine okay. by a desire for intellectual respectability by pride of scholarship by an attitude of anti-fundamentalism by the division of biblical truth get this into categories of important and not important in other words, they're saying the Bible, this part's important, this part's not. I'll give you an example in just a minute. By a general mood of softness and tolerance of a desire for a less strict Christianity and of a weariness with theological fighting. Yeah. Pretty good definition, I thought. All right. This new evangelicalism is an old attitude of compromise between the Bible and the world. That's simple. I would challenge you to find anywhere in your Bible where God ever compromised with man. Now, we, we think compromise is a good word. We really do. We negotiate and all that kind of thing. I can't find where God negotiated. He's very clear. It's my way, or you're wrong. And we, we have to understand that and go with that. So, uh, is there anywhere that you found in Scripture where God said, I want you to know this, I just put this in here for filler. When I was teaching school, uh, the, I, I think it was a history class, 
And the very first week in the history class, uh, the first part of the year, I said, I want you to write me a paper. And I gave them a subject. And they turned them in. I told them about it, what kind of length I wanted and that kind of thing. I told them what the subject was. And they turned them in. And so that night I read them. And the next class, I had a trash can sitting right beside my desk. And I said, these are the papers that I got yesterday. These are the papers that I have read. And I'd like for you to understand how I feel about them. And I dropped them all in the trash can. I said, now, when I was in school, and I've already told you I didn't like school, but if I did anything at all, I considered myself to be the king of fluff. If you told me I had to write a 500-page paper, I had about 30 words in there that probably mattered, and the rest of it was fluff because I had to put 500 words in there. I mean, I would say the same thing 10 different ways, wording it differently and doing, doing all that. I Fluff and fluff and fluff and fluff. Has God ever done that? Is, the, is somewhere in the Bible fluff? Is, the, is this, this doesn't matter. Now, some parts of Scripture are hard to, uh, they're hard to read sometimes. My dad used to say, people had to be real intelligent back in to pronounce the names. And I, I get that. But there's a, there's a section in Scripture, by the way, that it says such and such begat such and such. That's not important, is it? You ought to study it. You ought to see where those families moved and what they did and, ha and how that all fit into God's plan. And God saw fit to tell us that this person begat that person. And sometimes they will say, well, for, for example, in, in, in the book of Genesis, this person lived to be this age and then he begat such and such, you know. And we read that and say, well, what does that matter? You ever studied Methuselah? Do you know when Methuselah died? I do. He died the year of the flood. I didn't say he died in the flood. He died the year of the flood. How do we know that? The Bible told us. Have you ever noticed that Methuselah lived to be older than anybody else? Have any idea why? Long-suffering of God. Because when Methuselah was born, the very name that he has was telling the world, when I'm gone, judgment comes. And when Methuselah died, the rain started to fall. After that. The long-suffering of God. I'm bringing judgment, and I'm giving you a door of opportunity. But there's coming a day when the door shuts. You could just jump by over that and say, well, Methuselah was the oldest man ever lived. There's a reason. But to look at that and say, well, that's not important. Oh, it opens up so many doors and lets you know so many things. Right? This idea of New evangelicalism. A very well-known, I'm, I'm not going to name him, not because of, you know, I'm trying to protect him, but I'm just not going to name him. But there is a very well-known preacher, American pastor, that made the statement, and I'll use his word, that we, there's a need today to unhitch from the Old Testament. Now, I know that this is a New Testament church. I understand that. But did that unhitch us from the Bible? I, find, I really find the greatest clarity of what happens in the New Testament by understanding the Old Testament. To unhitch from it? We don't need it? So what is he saying? Remember the definition? Old Testament's not important. How can you have fellowship with that? Yeah, I know what that, I know what that labels me as. I get it. <clears throat> I'm just mean. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm hardcore. And what they told me in St. Lucia, I'm a purist. I get that. That's okay. That's all right. But new evangelicalism is a compromise of the truth. And can two walk together except they be agreed. Oh, by the way, I got that out of the Old Testament. Just thought I'd throw that in. It leads down a shallow path of positive thinking. That, way, that, way, that doctrine that they have. There's no fellowship to be found there. You may say, but there's common ground to be found here, to which I would reply, but there's much uncommon ground that compromises the good ground. And why is there a need for compromise? Why? To get along with them? To get along with them is to step away from God. If you have to compromise to be with them, then you've compromised your position with God. And like I was telling the pastor, I, I have to stand before God one day. And so do you. you know. I, uh, Lord, I was just trying to get along. And he may look back and say, but you were not trying to get along with me. Compromise. Compromise. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 says this, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, since that's true, that's a good way to define that word, wherefore, since that's true, come out from among them. Oh, you just being mean again. Oh, by the way, I didn't write this. <laughs> God wrote this. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, it will contaminate you, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. If we are to walk with God in the light, we must walk in accord with that light, and according to the Scriptures, we must mark those that walk differently. Listen, I can be nice to people. I want to be nice to people. But that doesn't mean I have to agree with you. And it doesn't mean I have to walk with you. And you can criticize me all you want to. But I still have to stand before God. And He's the one that's supposed to matter the most in your life. If we are to walk with God in the light, we're going to have to mark some other people. And it says here, come out from among them. <clears throat> oh, but we'll reform them. Well, I'll tell you right now, only God can reform them. Right. Only God can change them. I, I heard an illustration of this one time. They said that uh, 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 Charles Spurgeon was a big man. And there was a, a young lady in his church that was getting ready to, that was saved, getting ready to get married to a man that wasn't saved. And uh, Pastor Spurgeon said, I want to show you something. Come in my office and let me illustrate something to you. And he said, I want you to stand up on my desk. And she stood up on his desk. And he reached up and he said, grab my hand and pull me up on the desk. He said, this is what you think you're going to do to him. He said, but let me show you what's going to happen. And he pulled on her arm, pulled her off the desk into the floor. He said, this is what he'll do to you. That's why the Bible says, be not unequally yoked. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll change him. Listen, Nancy and I were both saved when we got married, and she still ain't been able to change me.
We have to realize if we're going to walk with God, it has to be God's way. We can't walk contrary to that. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6 says this, Let no man deceive you with vain words. Well, there are plenty of those out there. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes dark, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk like it. Act like it. Live like it. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Is false doctrine acceptable to God? Then don't have fellowship with it. What God accepts should be what we accept. What He says is right is what we should say is right. And that's the direction we should go. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You remember? Doctrine... Reproof, correction, instruction. How do you reprove false doctrine? With the real thing. That's how you do it. I suppose that a new evangelical would say that I'm, a mean, I'm mean-spirited because I just read from the Word of God that the unfruitful works of darkness are supposed to be reproved. No. The Bible says that what we're supposed to do is speak the truth in love. You're trying to help somebody. Be careful. When you walk through the door of fellowship with the world and its religion, you close the door of fellowship with God. Now get this, you close the door of fellowship with God. That's why in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is knocking on the door. Because that church of the Laodiceans got their doctrine messed up, got their attitudes wrong, became self-centered, and they abandoned the walking in agreement with God. And when they did that, they shut the door of fellowship. And Jesus had to knock. All right, now, the door of salvation, first door. Second door, the door of worship. Third door, the door of fellowship. Now, you want to do something for God? I hope so. I didn't hear anybody. You want to do something for God? You, you got to go through the first three doors. You're going to have to be saved. You're going to have to be worshiping God, putting Him in His rightful place in your life and you in the rightful place. I heard this in, in uh, Bible school one night. A fellow got up and he made this statement. Never will forget it. He said, the, the, uh, the higher I put God in my life, the lower I have to put myself. But the higher I put Him and the lower I put myself, the closer we get together. All right? So after we've gone through those three doors, there's another door. In order, now comes the door of service. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9, this was the theme verse for the meeting in St. Lucia. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to point something out to you real quick. Look at that verse very carefully. If you will notice that between the word me and and, there's a comma. Okay? I believe the Bible's perfect. And, and the more I study it, the more I just believe that. Okay? If you'll find in the Bible where the word and is between two things and there's no comma, it's putting those two things on the same level. They that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. If you'll notice, if you'll look that up in your Bible, you'll find out there's no comma. So spirit and truth are on the same level. In the book of Joshua, this is the first time I ever saw this. 
In the book of Joshua, it says that if you're going to serve God, you must serve God in sincerity and in truth. No comma. All right? Do you know some religious people that are sincere? Can I tell you that some of the most sincere people I've ever met were Jehovah's Witnesses? But they, somehow or another, they put a comma in there because they left out the truth. We serve Him in sincerity and in truth. They have to go together. One is not more important than the other. Having said that, in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, you notice there's a comma. What's the most important thing in this sentence? That God's opened the door. And it's effectual. It works. It operates. It will do what God wants it to do. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have some adversaries. But the adversaries are not on the same level with the open door. Our God's greater. When He opens up a door for us to go through, He said, I'm telling you right now, you're going to have some difficulties. You're going to have some problems. There's going to be people that don't want you to go through the door. There's going to be people that don't want you to do anything after you go through the door. Just count on it. I know they're there. He said, but I'm greater. And the door that I've opened for you is open and effectual. It's effective. It does something. Paul said he knew that this door was open unto him. He said it's opened unto me. All right? God never opens a door that he does not want us to walk through. Effectual means to be active and operative. Operative means that the door works. It does what God wants it to do. On the other side of that door is where God wants you to be, and you will, be, and you will find there what God wants you to do. But you have to go through the door. And the fact is that he said there'd be many adversaries. But it does not change God's reasoning for opening the door. Isn't it interesting that the God that calls us knows everything? It's a little phrase I heard several years back. I don't know. It, it might not, you know, strike a chord with you, but it sure did with me. Somebody said, do you know God can see around the corner? I can't. I don't even know what's going to happen an hour from now. God can see around the corner. And when God, now listen to me, we have to put all this together. And when God opens a door that he wants you to go through, he can see around the corner. He can already see that there are adversaries. He can already see that there's going to be opposition. He can already see that there's going to be difficulty. And he opened the door. Because he wants you to go through. We're going to have problems doing Christ for the Caribbean. I mean, not just the, the simple logistical problems, you know. I'm talking about there's going to be adversaries. We're talking about taking the gospel to, what is it, 44 million people. Do you think the devil's going to say, help yourself? No, no. But there's an, a door has been opened. And it's an effectual door. And just because there's adversaries doesn't change the fact that God wants us to go through the door. I'm glad. My God's greater. He didn't say it'd be easy. But he did say it was possible. But not if you just stand out there and look at the door. You have to go through. An effectual door. Always remember that the circumstances do not change God. They do not change His plan. 
nor do they change His purpose. God knows everything there is to know about everything when He opens the door. And when we find reasons to avoid going through the door, then we don't have the mind of God. When we do that, when we make all kinds of excuses, we're walking by sight, not by faith. The just shall live by faith. God opened a door, walked by faith right through it. Okay? It's important to realize that God can see around the corner. He knows the ending from the beginning. When He opens a door, He knows everything about the circumstances surrounding that door. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. Now, I want you to look in, in your notes up to Matthew chapter 14, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I have quoted from this and preached from this and, and, and mentioned this probably more than any other passage in the Bible because it's one of those things <clears throat> that when God showed it to me and I saw what was happening, it just helped me so much. All right? And it's so simple, maybe that's why we miss it. God told his disciples, Jesus said, get in the ship and go to the other side. Okay? Open door. Get in the ship, go to the other side. Now, you know this story. While they got in the ship and were going to the other side, what happened? A storm. A bad storm. We're not going to make it. So they were walking by sight. Because if they just listened to what Jesus told them, he said, get in the ship, go to the other side. Yes. There is a door that's opened and it's effectual. And yes, there are many adversaries, but I opened the door because I want you to go through it and do what I want you to do. I know there's adversaries. I know there's going to be a storm. I, I knew there was going to be a storm when I told you to get in the ship because I can see it around the corner. But I wanted you to get in the ship and go to the other side. And as we, as we look at this story, we see what happened. The evening was come, and they were alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. What's another word for contrary? Adversarial. An ad, an ad, uh, someone that's against you, in opposition. So it's contrary to them. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Oh, he was so worried. You can tell. Yeah. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. I think they ought to have been glad. But they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. The same one that told you to get in the ship and go to the other side. Here I am. I've got this. Okay? And Peter answered him and said Lord if it be thou bid me to come unto thee on the water and he said come and when Peter was come down out of the ship he walked on the water to go to Jesus when was the last time you did that oh by the way you can't do that now I'm not talking about necessarily I mean you can't walk on water if God wants you to but if God bids you come that means God's opened the door and wants you to go through it to do what he wants you to do you can do that even though it doesn't seem possible can I give you a couple of impossibilities in my mind? You ready? Christ for the Caribbean and a Bible college. Those are two impossibilities in my mind. I said in my mind. And God said, I'm going to open this door. I want you to go through. So what can you do? So Peter got out of the ship and started walking on the water. When he got out of the ship walking on water, he's walking by faith. And then, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, boy, he, he didn't have to catch up on his prayer life, did he? He said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, said unto him, O thou of little faith, 
Wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, well, how'd they get there? Well, they walked. And when they got into the ship, what happened? The wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over. Over where? To the other side. Did they have some trouble along the way? Sure. But they ended up on the other side. And we can do that. The Lord knew there'd be a storm. He knew there'd be a bad storm. Also, he knew what he, he wanted his disciples to do. He wanted them to go to the other side. So the Bible says he constrained them to get into the ship, knowing fully well what they would face. He opened a door to the other side, and he knew that they would go to the other side. All right? The potential of a storm might hold a, a sway over his disciples, but not over the Lord. <clears throat> Sometimes the adversaries scare us, but listen carefully. The adversary has never scared God. Never. The storm did not dictate to God. God dictated to the storm. And so we can, do, we can do the same thing and go forward. All right, now I'm going to add something a little personal here to consider. Uh, it's an observational statement from experience. I, I told him at the funeral today uh, when we got to the graveside, I, I started it off something kind of odd, I guess. <clears throat> I said, when I was young, my daddy taught me something. He had some of these, I call them country sayings. Uh, my dad never made it past the eighth grade. Uh, he was about, uh, about 14 years old, I think, and he went to work with a full-time job in Dan River Mill. He had to. And uh, it, when, when we look at education, he didn't have a lot. That didn't mean he wasn't a smart man. But he had very little education. But he would say things to me that being the hard-headed, you know, rebellious youngin' that I was, uh, I would sometimes just kind of shrug off, but to be honest with you, I really didn't because I heard it, and it stuck. And, and now I find myself quoting him all the time. This is what he said. He said, son, you never learned anything while you were talking. Now, what he was teaching me was the principle of observation. If you'll observe and listen, you can learn something. Instead of talking. Talking, 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 talking. Okay. I've observed people that had an open door open for them. And they let the attitudes and actions of men to keep them from going through the door. If you're basing what you do on what people say they will do, and that becomes your main consideration, then I promise you you're going to be let down at this point. But if God opens the door and calls you to go through it, then go through it trusting the one who called you. Your faith is in God, not in man. Uh, the door that was open for Paul, he called it a personal door. He said it was open for me. It's a door, a personal service, an open door should be taken personally. You ought to take it personally. Understanding it's the will of God for you. I had very well-meaning people, well-intending people tell me, you're crazy to go to Kentucky. Not because they had anything against Kentucky. But I, I'm, oh, please don't misunderstand this. But I, I'm just going to put it on, on this, this level. Not this level, but this level. I had it made. I could have stayed at that church till I died. 
Most of them like me. Fancy that. <laughs> but it was a personal door. It was for me. And the relationship in this call to the open door is between you and God. And some people will promise the world to you. And it's easy to fall into the trap of putting your faith in men over God, and that can influence the decisions that you make. I'm telling you this from experience. But that's all it is. It's a trap. The Bible calls it a snare. Grabs a hold of you and won't let you move. Right? Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. The just shall live by faith, not faith in men, but in God. God can certainly use men to be a blessing to you along the way. I mean, he's certainly done that. But there have also been those that have stood in the way. Uh, I believe Christ for the Caribbean, by the way, has that goal. It's to walk alongside the people of the Caribbean to help them to do what God wants them to do. But I want them to understand that Christ for the Caribbean is not their Savior. No. Uh, what Christ for the Caribbean is, it's an open door that God wants us to walk through together. If it's going to be successful, then we must walk by faith through the door and serve the Lord the way He leads. It's the same way with any decisions ever made at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Whatever ministries are, are, are started, whatever, whatever is done, it has to be done by walking through the door that God opens by faith in Him. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above. Man may promise that, but God can do that. Okay? Uh, those that will submit themselves to be used by God will certainly be used by God. But it will always be on God's terms. Never on ours. And I really believe this. What do you think is probably the greatest tool that you have as a Christian, as a born-again believer, if you're really going to do what God wants you to do. I believe the greatest tool is submission. Uh, and you can't, you can't put a comma between this, but submission and humility just go together. Yeah. Uh, submission's a key in the service of the Lord. Uh, submission takes your hands off the wheel and lets God pilot this thing. Uh, submission takes our plans off the table and listens to God. His plan is the only one that matters. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> now, in Colossians chapter 4, well, in verse 3, the Bible says, uh, With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Now get this. Uh, Paul said there's, a bit, there's an open door for me. It's effectual. And God wants me to go through it. And when he stepped through that door, he said, Now, oh, I need another door. I need to be able to do or to utter what it is God wants me to utter. Now what does that mean? Uh, a door of utterance. It's the opportunity to speak and the wherewithal to say the right thing. We can make it up. One of the hardest lessons I've learned in 40 years I've been doing this. When somebody asked me a question, say, I don't know. I wasn't good at that when I was younger. Because I thought I knew everything. <laughs> kind of like the preacher that had this couple come to him. Uh, they were having marital problems. And they said, could, could you help us, preachers? He said, I wish you to come 20 years ago when I knew everything. Now I'm not so sure. No. The idea was that Paul knew that for that door to be open, God would have to open other doors. And a door of utterance was to, was to speak what God wanted spoken and to do the right thing. 
A door of service has been opened, and there was a need for another door beyond that door, door of utterance. The, uh, this is the case in service for God. One open door that's passed through will lead to another door. And it, it's amazing. You go through that door, and you see all this. Oh, look at all this that God wants done. And somehow or another, on the other side of the wall over there, there's another door. And you have to work through what God wants you to do here to get to that door. And he opens that thing. It, it's amazing what God can do. It's amazing what God could do through us if we just do what God wanted us to and go through the door. Uh, Paul was looking for the opportunity. He was in bonds. And he said, I need a way to say what needs to be said and say the right thing, but I need to be able to do that in the circumstance I'm in now. Oh, it's pretty easy when the pastor says, why don't you just step up in the pulpit for the next four weeks and teach this? In Paul's case, he was bound. He said, but you opened a door. How can I do that now? He said, I need a door of utterance that I can say what needs to be said. His faith was in God. The naysayers, the skeptics, Oh, by the way, that's another word for adversary. Will do all they can do to discourage you. But God opened the door, so go through and do what God wants. All right? Now, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful. What's the next word in your Bible? Servant. Okay. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. It does not say scholar, church member, deacon, or even preacher. It uses the word servant. Look, Tom Gillum's one of my favorite preachers. He has this saying. He does this. He says this a lot while he's preaching. He said, now this is so deep, I just don't know if you're going to get it or not. All right, you ready? Service is done by servants. And if you're not a servant, you're not going to serve. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You can have all kinds of titles which carry with it certain responsibilities. But servant, if servant is not the primary description of who you are in Christ, you're not effectual. The servant serves the master. In our relationship with Christ, Jesus is our Master, A door of service is opened for a servant. It's not for the haughty and the arrogant, the prideful, the opportunist, or the self-centered. When I said this in St. Lucia, I got a, they, got, they started laughing. It's not a, a, <laughs> it's not a career opportunity. It's an opportunity to serve God. A true servant always follows the leadership of God and does the will of the master. Okay, now, if you'll hang in with me just for a few more minutes. I'm almost to the point where I can maybe finish this next week. Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> a servant does what the master says the way the master says to do it. Now, I'll, I'll ask you a question, simple question. What right do we have to question the master? Well, I mean, we do, but do we really have that right? Should we do that? I mean, if I'm questioning the master, what I'm saying is, I just might have a better idea about this. And the master says, no. Now, if you're going to serve me, you have to serve me my way. 
If you're going to walk in fellowship, you have to walk my way. If you're going to be saved, you have to go through the door that I open. If you're going to have to, if you worship me, you're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. So, when you follow the direction of God who sees around the corner, you do what he says the way he says to do it, whether you understand it all or not. This is a great passage of Scripture to describe that. Acts chapter 16 and verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia in in the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, All right, now wait a minute. You mean the Holy Spirit of God told Paul not to preach? Yeah, that's what he said. That's right. That's what he said. Well, I don't understand that. Yeah, but you can't see around the corner either. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. You mean to tell me there's no lost people up there? Doesn't somebody need Jesus up there? Well, the answer to that's yes, but then why not let Paul go? Because servants don't lead, servants follow. Verse 8, And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Notice this. Assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. All right. Paul's desire was to go into the area of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. The area that he really wanted to go into, he had been into a parts of Turkey, of that area, but he wanted to go a little bit further north and a little bit further east. And God said no. Now, I, I can assure you there were lost people in the northern part of Asia Minor and in the eastern part of Asia Minor. But verse 10 very clearly shows us, God says, this is what I want you to do. I've opened a door for you specifically. This is the direction I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. Okay? Keep in mind, God sees around the corner. Okay? All right. God had a plan for Paul. So he closed one door and opened another. God's plan works better than our plan. He certainly cared about those people of Asia, but his plan was to reach them in a different way, so God sent Paul to Europe. Aren't you glad? I've never been to Europe. But the gospel's been to Europe. And the gospel came from Europe to here. Talking about a far-reaching far ministry. How about that? Wouldn't it be interesting to trace that thing back? The one that told me about Jesus and the one that told him and then the one that told him and then the one that told him. Do you know you could trace that thing back to Paul for it's over with? How's that even possible? Because Paul listened to God. Now, I haven't forgotten about the people in Asia Minor yet now. Don't, we and God hasn't forgotten about them either. Okay. Look in chapter 19. What about Asia? In Acts chapter 19 and verse 8, the Bible says this, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, this is Paul. But when divers were hardened... And believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years. Look at at the word now. 
so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. All right, let's look, look what happened. God used Paul later in his ministry to teach in the school of Tyrannus. Notice from the text who was there. It was men from Asia. You know what we call them today? Preacher boys. Come from that area. They sat under Paul. Paul taught them. They left Ephesus and went home to those very places that Paul wanted to go in chapter 16. So Paul followed God and did what God wanted him to do, and we got the gospel. And God had Paul come back to Ephesus and teach these Asia Minor preacher boys. And they went back to their hometown. Just to show you, best I can figure out, now if I'm wrong about this, I, I've missed something. And it's very possible I can do that. But of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you remember it says these are the seven churches of Asia? The only one that I know of that Paul was ever in was Ephesus. He didn't start the other ones. I wonder who did. Those preacher boys. God didn't forget Asia. He sees around the corner. And if he tells you to do something and you don't understand, but I thought this would be better, you can't come up with a better plan than God. Quit trying. Right? God had a plan to reach Asia. That was his plan, and his plan worked. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you... You didn't think I would do this, but I'm going to give you some homework. I'm gearing up a college. I'm going to give you some homework. <clears throat> it's tough now. It's tough, and I'm going to give you some homework. Between now and next Wednesday, I want you to read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, which is the next verse that you see in your notes. I want you to read that verse over and over again. You read it as many times as you want to. I'd like for you to read it so many times that if I ask you to next Wednesday, you come in here and quote it backwards. But don't quote it backwards. Because you're going to get it out of order if you do that. But I want, you to, I want you to just read it and read it and read it and read it. And I'll ask you this question as you continue to read it. Do you think it's possible for you to do anything of any eternal spiritual value without God? Now, I'm going to do your homework. No. So much so that God had to save you and change you before you could ever do, what's my two words? Good works. Read that verse over and over and over again. Have you heard the pastor allude to this several times? Next Wednesday night, we get to unto. We get to unto. And it's amazing what God did when He put us through the unto. Lord, we thank You for the great, great privilege to stand here tonight. Thank You for the perfect Word of God. May we not just be hearers only, but doers. May we realize 
that our fellowship is with you on your terms. That we need to be saved, we need to be worshiping, we need to have fellowship. And if we're going to serve you, we have to listen to what you say to do and the way you say to do it. We can't do it on our own. We can't be a loose cannon. The Lone Ranger in all this. Lord, we must be servants serving the Master if we're going to do anything of any eternal value. Lord, help us to, to really find a lodging place in our heart for this passage in Ephesians and realize what we can do because of what you've done. And we'll thank you, Lord, for us in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Pastor, if you want. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.